Welcome to the Sample Chapter Podcast, the show where authors read a sample chapter from one of their books. Here's your host, Jason A. Meiske. Hello, 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 my friends. Welcome to episode 58 of the Sample Chapter Podcast. My name is Jason A. Meiske, thriller author and your host. Back again to our regular schedule. That, uh, that first week of every month, we've started doing two episodes. A regular episode on Tuesday, and then a bonus one on Thursday. And it gets a little hectic, I, I have to admit. It's uh, a little more extra work than uh, what I've been putting in, but, you know, I, it's worth it. And I think it's, uh, I think it's been uh, really cool. I think people are really responding well to the extra episode. And, uh, yeah, we've definitely got a lot more downloads uh, during that period. So thank you for all of you out there that are listening that are subscribing and uh you know i just i really appreciate you and uh, you're helping make this show move right along where you can follow us that would be sample chapter podcast on social media facebook and twitter contact us through there or if you'd like you can reach out to us at our email which is sample chapter podcast at gmail.com any of those methods will come to us Uh, We can communicate back and forth. We can talk about author interviews, uh, what you like, what you don't like, or if you have a recommendation for a new author that you would like to hear about. If you are an author and you are interested in coming on the show, then please, by all means, don't be afraid to reach out to me. You know, the worst thing that can happen is I will say, I can't right now (laughs) because I've got a full slate of authors that I'm working on right now, you know, so it could be a few weeks or a month or more. But uh, that'd be probably the worst thing that I say. The caveat is, as always, if you are an author, then that means you are a published author. Whether you are indie or traditionally published, as long as that book is available, then you can come on the show and read a sample chapter and, uh, you know, tell the world about your book. And I'd be happy to talk to you about it. So we do have some really, really exciting news that, oh my gosh, I wish I could go into. (laughs) <laughs> it's kind of a tease, but rest assured, we have picked up a, a very exciting new sponsor that uh, actually we, we've just finalized some things. We've got some details that we're working out as far as they're going to have a 30 second ad. There will also be a uh, coupon code for listeners. So stay tuned because, oh my goodness, this is so exciting and I, I cannot wait to go into it. So stay tuned. Make sure you are a subscriber and, uh, you know, so you don't miss out because with any luck, next week will be our first episode with that sponsor spot. So stay tuned. Also, coming up next week right here in Warrensburg, Missouri, we have the UCM Children's Literature Festival. It is March 17th through the 19th. They have more than 30 authors are going to be in attendance. And, you know, when I say children's literature, I don't mean it's just, you know, little kids or anything i mean these are extremely talented authors i've been going through the bios of a bunch of them i can't wait to meet so many of them I, i'm going to be actually a uh, uh working with one in particular because i'm volunteering for the day and that's going to be really cool but uh, yeah they've got you know ya and some books that are actually a little more historical than ya so they've, they've got a really great slant but you know it's something that uh, kids could learn from and uh, I, I can't wait. This is going to be an exciting time. If you're in the area, make sure you come on by and uh, check it out. Go to the website for more information at clf.ucmo.edu. And there will be a link in the show notes for that. I also want to shout out for our current sponsor and longtime friend of the show, U Store All, also here in Warrensburg, Missouri. Uh, for all of your self storage needs, make sure you go to ustoreall.net. To check out their website, check out everything they have to offer. Their facilities are fully fenced, gated, you get your own private gate code, and more than 50 cameras recording 24 hours a day. Check them out online, give them a call, they'll be happy to answer all of your questions. Again, that is ustoreall.net, spelled the letter U S T O R A L L. Then there will also be a link in the show notes. Also, need to uh, want to give a big shout out to our buddies at Pop Goes the Culture Podcast Network. Uh, working on some things. I'm hoping to hook up with them coming up real soon here in Kansas City. Uh, we have, there's a, a big event up at the uh, Comic-Con. I don't know if I'm going to be able to go the whole weekend, but certainly I'm going to try and make it up there on Sunday. 
and uh, hang out. I know of, of a couple of authors, even even an author who's been on the show before, William Schlichter, from earlier on last year. He is going to be up there uh, doing a panel about zombie writing. So if you are in the area, <laughs> if you like Comic-Cons and you can make it to Kansas City at the end of March, uh, go on up there, check things out. And on Sunday, I should be there. That's what I'm, I'm shooting for. And I want to hook up with our buddies at Pop Goes the Culture because they will also be there. Uh, they've got a panel, I believe, and, and I, I'm not sure if they have a booth or not, but... You can find out more by going to their website at Pop Goes the Culture Network. Uh, I'm going to have a link in the show notes. Check out all their other shows. They've got their flagship Pop Goes the Culture podcast. There's the, the Backlot at Alamo Draft House. You know, those are two of my favorite shows on there so far. But they also have other ones. For example, the Back in Time Pod, Two Dads Review, Gen X Grown Up. I mean, in all, they have 23 shows. Awesome, awesome stuff. Check them out. Follow the link in the show notes. Pop goes the culture. <laughs> oh my goodness. Anyway, all right. So, our author this week is Ann Joyce. She hails from Indiana and is a sci fi dystopian author. We had a really wonderful talk. She She's delightfully shy. It was really, really sweet talking to her, and she's got the cutest little giggle, you know, li listening to her and making her laugh. It just, oh my gosh, it'll just warm your heart. Uh, we talk about her influences, uh, some of which came from, you know, harsh events as, as a child that she's going to talk about, uh, and things that, that led to her poems and poetry, and, uh, you know, kind of helped build up who, uh, you know, the kind of person that she is today. Uh, she's also living proof of someone who had a book that was doing well. Uh, life got in the way. She took a break for a few years uh, with no additional writing. No, nothing new came out. And then she came back out with a vengeance. And yeah, she's doing really great. She's been becoming very successful. And I'm so proud of her. Also, you know, I think maybe, I think this is the secret right here. And, and I can tell you right now, if you are a fisherman, just like she is, I think that is the key to success. <laughs> so yeah, she, she's a woman after my own heart, uh, an avid fisherman, and uh, also enjoys going out moral hunting, uh, morale hunting, uh, which is, man, that's just around the corner. So it's coming up soon. Go, get out there and find those mushrooms. Anyway, instead of mushroom hunting over right now, we're going to get on over to our interview with... <laughs> The delightful Anne Joyce. Greetings, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Sample Chapter Podcast. This week, we are visiting with science fiction dystopian author Anne Joyce out of Indiana. Anne, welcome to the show. Thank you. How are you doing this weekend? I'm doing all right. How about you? Uh, not too bad, not too bad. It's actually, it's my granddaughter's uh, birthday this weekend, but they're out shopping, so this time worked Aww. out perfectly. So. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, anyway, well, uh, go ahead and tell the audience a little bit about yourself. Um, I am, uh, like you said, I mainly write uh, science fiction dystopian books. Um, I started writing poetry when I was... 13. Um, I'd write comic books when I was a kid. And then when I got in my 20s, it just kind of progressed to novels and novellas. Um, I like to go fishing in my free time and morel hunting and camping. And I have three very spoiled cats. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Yeah, I, we were talking about that before the show. Our, our, we both have that love for camping and, and fishing and uh, that's my self-made moniker is the, uh, the writing fisherman that I have a blog I've been doing for a couple of years. So it's, I gotta, I gotta go fishing a couple of times a year at least. Oh, nice. <clears throat> well now, uh, so uh, yeah, I was reading up about you with your, your short stories, your comic books or anything as a child. Can you tell us a little bit about some of those stories? Um, actually, um, when I was a kid, I, um, my comic books, my stepdad at the time, I made him a superhero. <laughs> so it was super Gary bat battling the villains. And um, my cat Tigger and our dog were actually his sidekicks. 
<laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. No one's ever asked me about that before, but yeah, Gary always got a kick out of it. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that's great. That's and great. the cat, I, I called her super puker because that cat, I don't know what was, she had stomach issues and she threw up all the time. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my gosh. Okay, so please tell me that maybe one day we'll see a resurgence in uh, in these comics and short stories. <laughs> <laughs> hey, maybe. Oh, that's that's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> And then, uh, so you went, you went from there into some poetry, and you even had a poem, uh, She Didn't Come Home, that won honorable mention for literary excellence. That's great. How, how did that come about? Um, that, oh, I, I wrote that when I was about 14 or 15. I, um, I was bullied really bad when I was a kid, so I didn't have a lot of friends and you know, didn't have a lot of people to talk to. And I lived near the bullies too. So I was constantly surrounded by these people who hated me for no reason. So it was just kind of my outlet to get things out. Mm. And I thought about running away a lot. So I think that's where that came from. And yeah, I don't remember where uh, I found the poetry contest mm -hmm. um, with the Iliad Press. But yeah, I entered it a couple years later and they came back and told me I was a board nominee. I was like, oh, okay. Sweet. <laughs> wow, that's awesome. Did that get did that get published in anything? It did. It got published in a poetry book. I think it was called Searching for Soft Voices. Oh. Yeah, that was twenty years ago. <laughs> oh, okay. All right. So you've you've got the rights to that back then by that by now I'm sure. Yeah. Okay. All right. Is that available online or, or maybe you're putting together a collection sometime? Um, I'm not sure. Honestly, I have, I haven't even looked, um, checked to see where searching for soft voices is. So yeah, I haven't really done a whole lot with, uh, my poetry for a couple of years. Mm. Just kind of, yeah, since writing novels and everything, it's been on the back burner. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. No, I understand that. I, uh, Oh gosh, just under 20 years ago when my wife had joined the uh, Air Force, I spent my first couple of years studying um, with the Children's Institute of Literature uh, correspondence courses. And uh, then I got a couple of articles I wrote online. And it's funny because you know, they never really went anywhere, but I can still search for them and find them online, even though I think... I think the website's defunct, but they're still out there. They're still available. I don't know if they got shared by somewhere else. Uh, I think I last looked them up about three years ago. I was doing some writing for another company and, and I was like, oh yeah, I've got references. Here you go. And it's it's crazy how this stuff, all these years later, it's still out there somewhere. So so maybe that is too. Yeah, maybe so. <laughs> <laughs> It'd be cool if it was. Yeah. Well, now, uh, so uh, with your superhero stories as a child and the poems uh, that were, were definitely inspired with the real life, you went into some science fiction. Uh, what uh, what kind of influences do you have for, say, like your first book, uh, When the Chips Are Down? Um, with Chips, actually, it was a political post on a social networking site mm. that um, got my creative juices flowing with that. It was just kind of um, a post, that, kind of like a conspiracy theory post about how, you know, the government was – planning some bad things and microchips were part of it. It was a lot of different things, mm -hmm. but so that's where I got the idea of, you know, what if they put these chips in your head to control your thoughts, they can tell you to do anything. They can make you their robots They're you know, they can make a super army. So that's where that idea stemmed from. Oh, wow. Okay. Now, do you, uh, <clears throat> do you have a lot of, uh, a lot of your inspiration? Does it come from, uh, um, other real world events like this from news posts, or do you, uh, uh, enjoy some movies or other books that inspire you? Um, sometimes I get inspired by movies or books, usually not like a whole idea, like certain little bits and pieces will kind of inspire me, um, to do certain scenes. Like I kind of like that idea. I'd like to take mm -hmm. that and, you know, go somewhere different with it. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, a lot of my inspiration comes just from the world around me, stuff I see on the news, I see on certain, 
blogs, you know, something that may be true or it's, you know, speculation. But yeah, that's where I take my ideas and build on them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, you know, I think those tend to have the most uh, grip on us as authors. Uh, the ones that come from either real world experiences or things that we're interacting with, such as a, a, a news article or something. Uh, Cause it's, like you said, I can watch a movie and go, oh, well, I would do that differently. It's interesting, but I would do it this way. And, and that kind of sticks in the back of your head maybe, but you get um, interaction with a friend or you hear about something and it starts, sparks a conversation. And all of a sudden in the back of your mind, you're building a story based on that. And I think those stick with this longer than, uh, than a movie or, or a book does sometimes. Right. I've got a friend who she's like, she's always about conspiracy theory posts and she'll, she'll send me news articles too, or about, you know, latest stuff that's going on. And she's like, Oh, here, this would be a good idea. This is, she's always like trying to plant little seats in my head for ideas. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great. <laughs> well, now, so, uh, when the chips are down, that one came out in, t in 2013 and then, right. uh, your next one was arid that came out in 2018. Right. Okay. Now, what what was the that five year gap? What, what were you working on that, or, or was just kind of life got in the way? Yeah, pretty much. Kind of just <laughs> life got in the way. Yeah, I definitely had some life altering events within that time. So, mm. yeah, I don't really remember what sparked me back into writing, but yeah, once I did, it was just kind of like coming home again. Oh, that's great. Yeah, I my first book, I started actually started it in 2011, and it didn't come out until, well, it'll be a year ago this April uh, before I finally got it done. But it, I had about a three- or four-year period in between where I didn't do any work on it at all. And it was just, yeah, you get things come up and things things happen. But uh, oh, it's, yeah. it's great that you came back to it, though. Well, so tell us about, <laughs> uh, tell us about Arid. How, uh, where did this come from? The idea, um, I actually, I think it was a news article or a video, something like that. I don't remember if, oh, actually, yeah, I do. Um, part of it was um, I saw on a news or on a podcast about um, how they're draining a lot of lakes and rivers in uh, Michigan and some of the northern states without really any explanation and there's a lot of speculation as to why that's being done and i know like you know certain and it was also i read that certain cities you know um if they're experiencing droughts like companies will drain some lakes and they will sell that water to other cities mm. so yeah i thought that was interesting so i thought you know that would give some that could give them an idea you know oh we can sell this water and I just kind of built on it from there, you know, a complete privatization of natural resources. Wow. Yeah, that sounds fascinating. So, and that's what, as it says here, some of your reviews about that, it's just a compelling story that may be closer, a closer feature, a future, if I can speak here, a compelling story <laughs> that may be a closer future than we think. So it sounds really amazing. Thank you. Uh, I don't know if everyone knows this, uh, in a lot of places it is illegal to collect rainwater. I did mention that in Arid. Um, I think some farmer not long ago, he got fined a ridiculous amount of money for collecting rainwater. So, I, yeah, that uh, also aroused a little suspicion in me. Yeah, yeah. I, I think it's uh, I think that's a rule here in uh, in Missouri, too. It just, yeah, it, it's a little strange <laughs> it's one of those laws yeah. I, I don't really understand well uh so what uh so that's aired that came out in october what uh, what's next from you what are you what are you working on i am working on a prequel to arid right now called parched the days before exile and it's um a short story of some of the main characters before they were cast into the wastelands and what led up to that Nice. Do you have a uh, maybe a timeline for this? Not right now. I don't. Um, hopefully this summer, but yeah, I'm not for sure yet. 
Oh, well, that's still, that's still great though to have it. <laughs> I mean, that's still pretty soon. So sometimes, uh, you know, you ask that question, it's like, oh, that's uh, maybe next year or the year after. So that's great that, uh, we're going to get something else from you, uh, in that, in that world, uh, here sooner than later. So that's exciting. <laughs> Well, uh, well, where can uh, where can people find you and follow you online? In um, I uh, have a website. It's aridbook.com, a r i d, and um, I also have a web page called anjoycewriter.com. Um, I'm also on Instagram. Uh, my handle is anjoycewriter. Great. Okay. Yeah, and I will make sure to have links to all of these in the show notes. So everybody listening, you can click those links later on and uh, follow up and and of course uh, get over to her amazon page and check out these books uh for me on this show one of the things i really enjoy is i have finally got a kindle unlimited uh, account so <laughs> to keep me from from getting uh, broke because every <laughs> week i'm talking to great authors and hearing these amazing stories i'm like okay i gotta read that oh oh yep oh yep i gotta read that too and so yeah this is great because your book's on kindle unlimited as well so it's it looks like my uh, reading to be read pile is just going to continue getting bigger and bigger. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much, and I've really had a great time with you on the show. And uh, yeah, I can't wait to uh, check back in with you later on and hear about Parched uh, when that's available. And uh, look forward to talking to you again in the future. Well, thank you. Thank you for having me on the show. That's my my pleasure. Well, ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, I'm going to hand the floor over to. Miss Ann Joyce and Arid. Thank you. Um, I decided I'd read chapter two because, um, you know, chapter one's available on Amazon and chapters three through five are actually available on the aridbook.com webpage. So I wanted to read something that wasn't readily available. So this is chapter two. Bang, bang, bang. The pounding on Joshua's jaw jolted him out of bed. He glanced out of his tiny window. The sky was still dark and dotted with stars. Dawn would soon be approaching. I'm coming, he muttered. He staggered across the room and opened the door. Paula stood on his front step like a wilted flower, her sleek black hair messy. Her big brown eyes were puffy and red. Edgar's dead. Maria, Julio, Blaine, and Skyler stood around Egger's body on Ziamara's bed. I did everything I could. He needed IV fluids. He needed a lot more than what we have, Ziamara said when Josh and Paola entered her hut. He could tell that she'd stayed up all night with Egger. Ziamara always looked tired. Her jet black hair was graying. Fine lines trailed from her cheekbones to her jawline. The role of Shackville nurse was draining her. You did your best, Joshua rested a hand on her shoulder. We're having a moment of silence, Julio said. Joshua, Ziamara, and Paola joined the circle. Joshua thought of the first member of their group to die. He was diabetic and ran out of his medication. He begged the purifiers to get him some insulin, but they refused. They said he wasn't valuable enough to waste that kind of money on. It wasn't long before he became delusional and incoherent. When he started vomiting every day, Joshua knew it was a death sentence in the desert. He couldn't even remember the man's name, but Joshua was saddened by his passing. Egger's death just made him angry. He thought of all the wealthy moguls living like kings, eating steak and caviar while Egger was literally dying for a glass of water. Judging by his expression, Julio seemed just as angry. Everyone else just looked depressed. Are we going to bury him? Schuyler wanted to know. The ground is too hot dry. It hasn't rained for months, Julio said. He should have a proper burial. He doesn't deserve to be eaten by buzzards, Schuyler said. We'll bury him. It might be a shallow grave, but it's better than nothing, Blaine replied. Blaine worshipped Schuyler, and no one could blame him. She hadn't bathed in weeks like everyone else, but it took little away from her beauty. At first glance, she looked like a mirage with her striking blue eyes and long, long hair. Joshua wondered for the hundredth time how she ended up in the wastelands. She could have been a fashion model or an actress. He could only guess that she was there because of Blaine and had chosen love over everything. 
She never complained about their situation, nor did she seem to have any regrets. Shit, this ground is harder than bricks, Julio grunted. He and Blaine stabbed at the earth with their shovels. Joshua and Ziamara carried Egger's body outside, wrapped in a bedsheet. This is as deep as we're going to be able to dig, Blaine wiped the sweat from his brow. That's more than good enough, baby, Skylar said. Does anybody have any last words, Julio asked, when Josh and Ziamara lowered Egger into the hole? Let's say our final goodbyes inside. It's freezing out here, Maria said. You're just cold because you're not working up a sweat like Blaine and me, Julio replied. No, she's right. It's a lot colder than it's been in weeks, Joshua stared at the sky. Several birds flew in the direction of the rising sun. I haven't seen birds in so long, other than crows and buzzards. Those don't look like either, Ziamara gasped. Are you thinking what I'm thinking? Joshua glanced at Julio. I'm with you, bro. Someone else can cover the grave, Julio threw down his shovel. Where are you going? Talos said. We're going to find some food. It's cool enough right now to set out on a journey, Joshua replied. When you see birds, it's a good sign. They know where the food and water are. Julio pulled a bandana from his pocket and tied it around his face. Can I go with you? Please, 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 Paolo begged. If it's all right with your mother, Josh said. Maria nodded. Okay, then let's go get our flashlights and water containers. You'll need something to wrap around your face so you don't get sunburned. Paolo took Joshua's hand and walked with him to his hut. Maria watched them with a smile. Joshua was more of a father to her than her real father ever was. Maria had married Juan because she was young, pregnant, and scared. He promised to fulfill her greatest dreams, but Juan proved to be as useless as his words. He had been an abusive husband and a negligent father. His reign of terror ended when he tried to get tough with a purifier and received a fatal blow to the head. Maria never admitted how relieved she was to be rid of him. It was the only good thing a purifier ever did for any of them. Rest in peace, Edgar. I wish the world was a better place. Blaine shoveled the last of the dirt over the grave. It won't be the same without him, Skylar said. You're right. Who will Julio argue with now? Blaine replied. All of my efforts are futile. I saved hundreds of lives at the hospital, but I can't help anyone here. Ziamara threw up her hands. The odds are stacked against you. We're living in a crude, harsh environment. None of us are equipped to deal with it, Blaine said. I'm tired of having a front row seat to the suffering. I don't want to think about who's next. I can't do us any good, she sighed. That's not true and you know it. Who found some aloe for Blaine when he was scourged with sunburn? You did. When Josh was sick from eating bad food, you gave him something to settle his stomach. We'd fall apart without you, Skylar said. Edgar was old and in poor health. He couldn't handle this place, and that's not your fault in any way. You've got to stop beating yourself up, Blaine said. He's right. You're taking this way too hard, Skylar agreed. Zia Mara stared off for a moment. Edgar kind of reminded me of my fiancé. Miguel was better with people, but he was very outspoken and wise like Edgar. I think that's why it's bothering me so much. You're engaged? Skylar raised an eyebrow. I was engaged, back when things were normal. He was a surgical technician at the hospital. He was a kind-hearted humanitarian who wanted to make the world a better place. We hit it off right away, of course. We lived in a flat together when all the chaos started. He was driving home one night and got carjacked. Some thugs saw a jug of water in the front seat, and they killed him for it. I'm so sorry, Skylar gasped. It was a long time ago. I wish I could have saved him, but it was out of my control. The same is true for Edgar. You're good friends for helping me realize that, she smiled. Let's go inside and relax for a while. I'm sure you could use a nap, Blaine suggested. Ziamara nodded. Blaine put his arm around her and walked with her to her hut. Where are you, Maria? Skylar called. I'm over here looking for some rocks to put over the grave. I don't want any animals to disturb it, she called.
from a small patch of brush. She emerged with a large stone and dropped it onto Edgar's resting place. Good idea, Skylar walked over to Julio's hut, picked up a broken concrete block in front of it, and laid it over the grave. Whatever we can do to keep the buzzards and coyotes away. Julio won't like that. He calls that thing a step. He can get by without it, Skylar replied. I guess he'll have to jump into his house now. He sure wasn't blessed with height, Maria smiled. They giggled. How's she doing? Skylar asked when she saw Blaine approaching. She's sleeping. Good. She was getting too worked up. The constant lack of sleep is taking its toll, Skylar said. I can't say I blame her. Burying a friend shouldn't be a normal part of your life, Maria stood and wiped her hands on her jeans, then stared at her hand. I think an insect bit me. My hand is tingling. Let me see, Skylar shined her flashlight on Maria's hand. It's red. Does it hurt? It feels like I've been shocked. Maria, I think a scorpion got you, Skylar furrowed her brow. Their stings tend to feel like many bolts of lightning. Trust me, I know. Oh, shit, Maria gasped. Come with me, Blaine put a hand on Maria's shoulder and guided her towards Ziamara's hut. Skylar followed. Hey, everybody, get out here. Come see what we've got. Maria looked through the window to see Julio triumphantly holding a snake. Ziamara blotted her forehead with a damp rag. Where are you guys, Julio called. Joshua shrugged. I'll let them know, Skylar ran from the hut. Check it out, Skylar. One of the cans in the ground was half full of water, and I killed a snake. He thought he could hide from me, but I outsmarted him. Are you hungry for some snake meat? Your husband can cook this thing, can he? Julio grinned. Skylar looked worried. You guys need to come to Ziamara's, she said. When they walked into Ziamara's hut, Maria was sitting on the bed, panting and sweating. Lie back, Ziamara put a pillow behind her. I don't want to lie down. It makes it harder to breathe, Maria said. Drink some water. It might make you feel better. Skylar poured a glass from Joshua's container and handed it to her. What's wrong, Joshua asked. She's been stung by a scorpion, Ziamara replied. Can't we have just one good day, Julio groaned. Is she going to die, asked Paola. Of course not, sweetie. Most scorpion stings are harmless, Ziamara said. Then why is she breathing like that, Paola said. She may just be having a reaction to the venom, Ziamara replied. Maria's vision started to blur. A burning pain shot through her body. She buried her face in her pillow and blacked out. Come outside with me, Ziamara, Joshua whispered. I don't want to have this conversation in front of Paola. Ziamara followed him outside. Do you think she's going to be all right? He asked, a worried look creasing his brow. It's hard to say. Judging by her symptoms, I don't think it was a striped-tailed scorpion that stung her, which is good because they can be an especially nasty species. It's possible she's having a, an allergic reaction to the venom. It might not be a severe reaction, but her breathing problems concern me. Now that I think of it, the thing was probably a bark scorpion. What the hell is that? They're the little brown scorpions. I know you've seen them before if you ever watch the Nature Channel on TV. Their venom usually isn't fatal, but it tends to cause adverse reactions like severe pain and nausea. So it could kill her? It's rare for an adult to die from a bark scorpion. It's most toxic to children and pets. I'm worried about her throwing up, though. What can we do? She needs to see a doctor. At the very least, she needs medicine. Well, you know we can't get her to a doctor, Joshua kicked at a rock on the ground in frustration. We can ask the purifiers for medicine when we see them. I doubt they'll oblige. I know, she sighed. It's not right that she has to suffer like this. Why don't you and Blaine get a fire going and cook that snake? I'll stay with her. Everyone but Maria sat around the fire and enjoyed their meal. Ziamara took a little food to Maria, and Joshua went to check on her after dinner. She was in a deep sleep when he arrived. She was snoring, and her thick eyelashes fluttered. She didn't eat much. She said her stomach was upset. I rolled her on her side, and it sounds like she's got a decent air exchange. It's a good sign, Ziamara informed him. You said she needs medicine. Is there anything around here that could help her? 
If we had more water, I could clean the wound. There are certain plant oils that might ease her symptoms, but I don't think you'll find those types of plants in the desert, Ziamira replied. Write down anything you can think of, Joshua instructed. I'll set out tomorrow before the sun is up. Be careful, Josh. I'll let Paolo stay at my place for now. Try to get some rest. A faint light glowed in the eastern sky when Joshua gathered his supplies and crept out the door, relieved that he didn't wake Paola. She stayed curled up on her straw mattress on the floor. He was in no mood to argue about why she couldn't come along. To his disappointment, it was already much warmer than the day before. It was going to be a risky and dangerous trip, and he asked himself why he was making it. I don't know if I'm brave or just a fool, he thought. He flung his knapsack over his shoulder and headed north, his flashlight leading the way. He thought a lot about Maria during his long, quiet walk and realized his fear of losing her was much greater than his fear of ending up like Edgar. He dodged a scorpion as it scurried across his path. This is all your fault, he grumbled. He shined his flashlight in the direction of some cans he placed in the ground several weeks ago. He lifted the rocks from the small plastic sheet covering the cans and took his supplies out of his knapsack. He pried the cans from their shallow holes and emptied their contents into his container. That's about a third of a cup, he sighed. Not good enough. A faint hissing sound to his right made him drop his container and freeze. What the hell is that? It was too dark to make out even a silhouette. He grasped his flashlight and turned ever so slowly. An angry Gila monster flicked its purple tongue. Oh, shit. I didn't mean to step on your turf. I'll just be on my way now, he whispered. The lizard took a step back and dug its nails into the earth. Joshua slowly hauled himself up and took a few steps backward. The Gila monster hissed again and crawled under some rocks. Joshua snatched his belongings and hurried away. He walked several yards before stopping and wiping his brow. That was way too close. I hope there aren't any more nearby. He shined his flashlight around. He'd never heard of anyone being killed by a gila monster, but he knew how painful and debilitating their bite and venom could be. The sun began to peek over the mountains. He used to love the sight of the western sunrise, but now it just seemed ominous. He glanced to his left and almost let out a cry of joy when he saw a shack several hundred feet away. I don't remember seeing this hut before. He closed his knapsack and walked cautiously toward it and peered in. A skeleton lay on the floor. Empty water cans were strewn around. Joshua tore the hut apart but found no supplies of any kind. The man's only possessions were a straw mattress, some empty wicker cupboards, and the clothes on his back. He searched the dead man's pockets and pulled out a picture of a smiling woman with dark hair and emerald green eyes. The purifiers dumped him here with a few cans of water and left him to die just like all the rest. Joshua felt his anger rise. I hope you're with her now, Joshua murmured as he tucked the picture back into the corpse's pocket and walked outside. Joshua drenched in sweat, Ziamara said when he staggered to her hut half an hour later. Here, this is all I could find, he handed her the water container. He went back to his hut and collapsed on the floor, then crawled over to his water cans. He couldn't hold back. He drank three days' worth of water rations. Josh, are you okay? Paula asked. I think I really screwed up this time. And that was Anne Joyce reading a sample chapter from her latest book, Arid. Be sure to click the links in the show notes for her, her website and social media, Amazon, all of the above. Also, don't forget to follow the links for all of our sponsors, our friends, and the children's literature event coming up next week. And as always, make sure that you subscribe to our show because as a subscriber, you never miss out on a new episode with a new author, a new book, and a new sample chapter. We'll see you next week, everyone. Bye.